Welcome. This is the first in a series of videos about the PIC32 family of processors from a software engineer's perspective. My goal is not to ignore the hardware details, but to highlight the aspect of those details that someone who's learning to program the processor requires. My friend Zumi will help make sure my explanations are clear. Hi everyone. I'll start with the obvious question. What's a PIC32? PIC32 is a family of processors that are designed for embedded control applications. Think about all of the things that have processors that aren't your computer. Your refrigerator, your car, the thermostat in your house, so on. Those are called embedded control systems. In general, they sense something about their environment and use that information to control something. Your thermostat senses the time of day and the temperature around it and uses that information to control your furnace. These kinds of systems are basically a chip in the middle of a circuit that gathers input and provides control for the output. All of these input and output things are called peripherals. The PIC processors are designed precisely for these situations. They support gathering data from lots of types of inputs and controlling lots of types of outputs. The name PIC is an acronym for Peripheral Interface Controller to highlight that purpose. In these videos, I'm going to talk about the PIC32 family of processors, but there are PIC8 and PIC16 processors as well. In this video, we'll talk about the architecture of the processors, the structure of the components inside the PIC. In future videos, we'll focus on how to program the PIC to control or listen to each type of peripheral it supports. Even if you're only going to be writing software for the PIC, and somebody else is responsible for designing the circuitry around it, it's really important to understand what's inside the PIC. The PIC is an example of a system on a chip. That means it isn't just a processor. In addition to the processing core, it has memory and buses that connect that core to a wide variety of I.O. circuits that can connect it to a wide variety of peripherals. The processing unit in a PIC device is called the CPU core. In the PIC32 MK series, it's a MIPS32 M4K core. That means that it's a 32-bit CPU that runs MIPS machine instructions. MIPS uses RISC design principles. RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. So the goal is to have a small set of instructions. By doing this, the stages of the pipeline can be pretty small which means that our CPU clock cycle is relatively short. The alternative would be to opt for highly specialized instructions, but that would require longer CPU cycles. The CPU core has a five-stage pipeline with all of the normal hazard detection, data forwarding, and branch prediction that you'd expect. That means that we can depend on the compiler to help optimize, but in situations where we need careful timing, we'll have to be aware of how the pipeline can affect the timing of instructions. In addition to the execution unit that does the CPU core's main processing, PIC CPU cores can also have coprocessors that offload specific kinds of operations. All PIC32 devices have a coprocessor zero, called CP0, that manages a virtual memory system and exception handling. The memory management unit provides access to the on-chip memory. When we need to, we can put the core into debug and attach an in-circuit debugger to use the JTAG debugging so that we can step through our code as it executes. You said there's a coprocessor for virtual memory. What does that mean on a PIC? Virtual memory means that there's a layer of indirection between the memory that the program thinks it has and the physical memory on the device. The virtual memory space is address starting at address zero, but how that maps to physical memory depends on what mode you're running in. The CPU core gives us three modes of operation. User mode provides a level of security because it can't access the kernel's virtual memory and the CPU zero functions are not available. Kernel mode is required to access all of the memory and to invoke any of the CPU zero functions. Managing virtual memory and handling interrupts seem like two very different things. Why did they put them on the same coprocessor? Interesting observation. Think about what happens when a user program is running and an interrupt occurs. CP0 will have to handle it. Often, handling an interrupt will require that we be in kernel mode because it could require access to things that we can't see in user mode. 
flipping to the kernel mode virtual memory has to be done, and lo and behold, CP0 controls virtual memory, so it can control that change of mode as well. The PIC32MZ series of chips uses either a MicroAptive or an M5150 MPU core. These are still MIPS cores, and they support everything that the MK cores supported. In addition, they have instruction and data caches between the execution unit, the ALU, and the memory management unit. In addition to CP0, this core also has a coprocessor to which we can offload floating point operations. There are also two application-specific extensions. The MCU ASE provides enhanced interrupt handling. The DSP ASE is a powerful digital signal processor. This optimizes processing of incoming complex signals, like input from a camera. So the MZ core makes the MZ family of PICs more powerful than the MK family. PIC32 chips have two kinds of memory. Flash memory is persistent and is used to hold the program and any data that must last even if the device loses power. Generally, this is configuration data that we don't expect to change often because writing to flash memory isn't trivial. We have to write a full per page, that's 4K bytes of flash at a time, and we have to erase it before we can write to it. You can see why we don't do that very often. The other kind of memory the PIC32 chips have is SRAM, which stands for Static Random Access Memory. RAM means that we can read or write any word at any time. But this data is volatile, which means that it does not persist through loss of power. The S in SRAM stands for static. The alternative is DRAM for dynamic RAM. SRAM is built using flip-flops, so as long as we have power, what we wrote to it will last. DRAM, on the other hand, has to be refreshed for it to not lose its information. This means that SRAM is faster and more expensive than DRAM, so it's only used in places that have smaller memory sizes. For example, in a PC CPU, the caches near the processor are usually SRAM, but the main memory is usually DRAM. Outside of the core, the PIC32 chips are designed around two buses with different clock speeds. The bus matrix runs with the system clock and connects to the CPU core, to memory, and a few other I.O. devices. The important thing about this is that the devices on this bus have direct access to the SRAM that the CPU core is using for storing variables. The devices that are attached to the bus matrix run at the same clock as the CPU. Two of these devices support the core. The prefetch cache caches data from the flash memory, speeding up reading of the next instruction. The block that is labeled ints here is the CP0 interrupt handler that we talked about before. It can have up to 96 sources of interrupts, timers or devices, and manages prioritization of those interrupts and up to 64 interrupt handlers. The rest of the blocks on the bus matrix connect to peripherals. Direct memory access devices have the ability to read and write the SRAM without the CPU core's assistance. This means that they can process the incoming data independently from the CPU core. USB and ICD blocks connect to USB devices and an in-circuit debugger. Remember that JTAG stuff we talked about in the CPU core? PIC32 processors all have a set of general purpose I.O. ports that are used for connecting directly to peripherals like LEDs and switches. Control, input, and output of these devices is accomplished via a set of registers for each port. The CPU core can read and write those registers to control whether a line is used for input or output, and to set what the outgoing signal should be or read what the incoming state of that device is. The second bus is called the peripheral bus. It connects the system to devices whose timing is likely to be different from the CPU core's timing. There are a wide variety of devices that can be here, depending on exactly which PIC32 device you choose. All of them have these devices. UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter and is a serial I.O. connection. We send and receive units of bytes but it actually sends them a bit at a time. 
This allows communication with many serial devices using a wide variety of protocols like RS-232. Some chips all support, also support the updated USART standard, which can achieve higher transmission speeds because it is half duplex and uses the clock signal to synchronize the two sides. The serial peripheral interface is another option for connecting serial devices. SPI sends a byte at a time and is therefore faster than UART or USART. The last two devices that all PIC32s contain are analog to digital converters and a real-time clock and calendar. The details of the peripherals differ between the MZ and MX families of PIC32s. The MZ family supports more types of devices and has four peripheral buses. Each bus can run at its own speed, but it must be a multiple of the system clock. Well, that's our high-level view of the PIC architecture. From here, I'll make videos covering the details of how you write software for each of the peripheral devices we can connect to.